Thank you, Jim. All right, open your Bibles to the book of Book of First Timothy. And so while you're doing that, I want you to consider a question. And I know, I know the answer to this, but I want you to consider it. Have you ever been in a disagreement so bad you thought there was no way out? You ever been in a situation so tense where two sides are so far apart from each other, you're just begging for someone to come and stop the madness? Like two boxers who are in the corner of the fight or in the corner of the ring, but they won't get in and, and fight. They're just staring at each other angrily, and you, you want something to happen, but no, they, they won't budge. Maybe this is two friends, your parents, your neighbors. Maybe this is you and someone else. When there is a problem between two parties that is irreconcilable, that cannot be bridged, mediation is needed. This is why we have civil courts. Because two parties can't come to an agreement on their own. And so someone else, an impartial person, must come in as a mediator. We all have tense situations and we've all been in something like this. And we wished that we had the wisdom of Solomon who knew how to just cut the baby in half and solve the problem. But it doesn't always happen. Thankfully, we have someone greater than Solomon. But as you have that picture in your mind, what happens when the distance isn't across a room or across a ring, but it's from earth to heaven? What happens if there is an ocean between you and the one you need to be reconciled to? What happens if there is no way for you to get from here to there in anything that you can come up with? There is no one to stand in your place. There is no one to help. We talked about this in our, in our men's study. If we could save ourselves, it would be like jumping from one side of the Pacific Ocean to the other with your legs broken and you're dead. What happens when it is that vast? What hope would we possibly have? Who could possibly stand or mediate on our behalf? And who would want to? Who would take that case? The sinful, wretched rebel who rails against his creator her creator who hates the one who formed him lives his entire life in opposition to him but expects mercy thinks he deserves good things that's one picture I want you to have in your mind here's a second picture Last week we talked a lot about prayer. Yet most of us don't even consider how prayer is even possible, or if prayer is even possible. What do I mean by that? How is it the same people from the last picture, us, sinners, can go before a holy, almighty, perfect God, and He would even hear us? He would even answer us. How is that even possible? How could we do that without trembling or dying? We deserve to be struck dead the moment we open our mouths. How do I have any expectation that when I pray that my prayers will be answered? How do we know that? And does everyone have the same expectation? Does everyone on earth have the same expectation that their prayers will be heard and answered? What we're going to see this morning is that there is one man who solves the problem to both of those. And this is continuing in verses 1 through 4 that we looked at last week. And so what we're looking at in verses 5 through 7 of 1 Timothy 2 is the theological and spiritual basis for the prayers that Paul commands in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. So we've got a lot to handle this morning theologically and spiritually. So hold on to your seats and let's dive in. All right. Uh, We're going to read verses 1 through 7, because this is one thought. Uh, I did not want to break this up, but there was no way I was going to handle it in two sermons, or one one sermon. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. Don't forget everything we talked about last week, and we'll allude to it a couple times. 
First Timothy chapter two, verse one. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Not because it is our right, but because it is our privilege. We come before you because we have been granted sonship through Jesus Christ. We speak in unity in his name. Lord, how could we ever understand your perfect mediatory work? How could we understand that a holy God would love us, would send his son to stand in our place? That chasm that we could not cross, that he would stand as our high priest, that our prayers and our voices would be heard before the throne of the Almighty God. The Ancient of Days hears the weak and feeble. Lord, we ask that Your Spirit would teach us this morning, work in our hearts, convict us of sin, remind us of righteousness, bring to our remembrance the words of Christ that we may look to Him in all things, that we may hold fast to our only hope, the only mediator, the only righteous one, the only begotten of the Father, the only wise and true, the only eternal Son. We praise Him. It's in His name we pray. Amen. So as we, as we read this, I want you to see there's a, uh, there's a, like a, like a creedal statement in these first few lines. Uh, this flows like a hymn would. Verse 5, for there's one God, there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, it's, it's, it's rhythmic, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at a proper time. This is meant to be remembered, to be recited, to be, to be sung probably, so that this would stick in your mind. This is a a great gospel formula, and we have a lot to unpack here. So let's begin at the word for. This connects last week to this. It gives us purpose. It gives us the clear basis. When Paul says pray, pray for all. And if you forget why you pray and why prayer is important, let me remind you of the one who makes it possible for you to pray. And let me remind you of the truth that we stand on. We don't pray apart from the truth of our doctrine. We pray because of it. Four, there is one God. We talked about this a little bit. We'll get into it a little bit more. But in the early church, the greatest division was between the Jews and the Gentiles. The arguments over circumcision, the arguments over tribes and festivals and, and Sabbaths. But if you're a Jew, you got a bit of a chip on your shoulder. Like, where are the ones who really deserve the inheritance? We're the one who have all the, con- the, the, um, the uh, covenants. And the Gentiles, they're, they're kind of second-class citizens. Paul is making a clear reminder here. There is one God. There's only one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is not something different. We're not talking about a different God here. He is reminding them of their history and uniting them under one God. Something similar is going on in the church at Corinth if they're trying to figure out what what food sacrifices the idols should be or or how how they should be viewed. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I want to pick up in the second half of verse 4. Notice Paul has the same train of thought here. He says an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. 
For although there are many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, there's this, this is full sarcasm here. And indeed, there are many gods, I think it's right to put the, that in quotations, and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, for whom all things and whom and for whom we exist, and one Lord. This creedal formula puts these two side by side, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. This is consistent throughout the history of the church. One God. There is no separation or, or distinction in essence or purpose between God the Father and God the Son. We want you to see here that it is Christ who brings us to the true and living God that you Jews have always believed in and you Gentiles who are now grafted into. So get along because our God is one and he calls us to be one. And so the idea here is that all men, going back to verse 4, remember or back in uh, second, First Timothy, verse 4, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. This good and pleasing thing that we pray for the salvation of those around us, of the leaders. Because here's the reality. All men need salvation. And all men only have one hope in one God. There's only one option. There's not different gods for different peoples. There's not a God over here for the Jews and a God over here for the Gentiles. There's, there's not a different plan of salvation for people in the Old Testament or the New Testament or people in this region or people of this skin color or whatever. There's one God. There's one hope. There's one salvation. And this hope, this message can be proclaimed to every person on the planet without exception. This is what Paul is getting at. Don't try to make divisions where there are none. Many of you are familiar with Romans 1.16. I believe in the power of the gospel. I'm not, excuse me, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for Jew and the Jew first and the Gentile, or whoever believes. This same gospel, this same good news, it is powerful and it saves. Whether you're circumcised or not, whether you have been among the covenant people of Israel your entire life, or you were converted five seconds ago, there is one God, there is one hope, there is one gospel. I love what John Stott says about this. He says, we have an exclusive faith, but an inclusive mission. We have an exclusive faith, meaning one God, one, one option for salvation, but an inclusive mission, meaning no one is exempt from the possibility of salvation. This inclusive mission, we invite every tongue, every tribe, every nation to our one God and his one salvation. And so now is where we need to camp out a little bit. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man. This is what makes our faith exclusive. The one mediator. This is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time in the sermon. Because we need to get this. This changes everything when we understand who he is as a mediator. And it changes everything if you distort the one mediator. So mediator, what is a mediator? Mediator quite literally is one who stands in the middle. It's an arbiter. The analogy we started at the beginning where you've got two people in, in their two respective corners and they're not moving. Someone needs to stand in the middle and reconcile the two. Remember that problem. The problem isn't just that there's a fight between you and your spouse or you and your sibling or you and your, your coworker. The problem is that there's a chasm, a Pacific Ocean of sin and death between how holy God is and how unholy you are. That's the problem, and so the mediator should equal the problem. How? Who would dare? Who would dare stand there? Who would dare attempt that? This problem is between God and men. Don't miss that. There is one mediator between God and men. And so I don't use Greek terms often, but this is helpful. Remember last week we looked at all people, anthropos. Same word here. Between God and anthropon, the, the, the all of man. Here's the problem. 
it's not just your problem or your problem or this person. All of mankind has this problem, and all of mankind is lost, dead without a mediator. Why? Because God's holy and we're not. That's the problem that Paul is setting up here. This theme continues. So if you were to read this in the Greek, this would jump off the page because his concern is for all people. Because all people have a problem. Good? So, what's the problem? Man sinned. Man needs a representative. God is offended. He needs to be satisfied. Who could bridge the two? How could the two be bridged? How can this be reconciled? This is why God created the sacrificial system. So the Levitical priest would offer sacrifices throughout the year. The high priest would go on once a year into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God with a rope around his waist, because if he wasn't pure, he would die and they'd have to yank his corpse out. This is not really a sustainable system. There have been many high priests, and this system's not even around anymore. They keep sinning. They keep dying. Is there something better? God gives them kings and gives them prophets and gives them priests, and there's hope that maybe one of them, maybe David will stand in between us. Maybe Solomon will stand in between us. Maybe Isaiah or Daniel or any one of the other prophets might convince God, might help the people come, but they all fell short. And so throughout Israel's history, there is promise of a one who would come. There's a promise of a priest and a king from Psalm 110. Priest according to the order of Melchizedek, who has no beginning, no end. This priest who will will intercede in a way unlike the Levitical priest could. There's a promise of a king that would come from the line of David. This promised anointed one from 2 Samuel 7. He will come from David and he'll have a throne that's forever. These, These things are are just rattling around in the back of the brain of the Jew. Is is it him? Is it him? Will he be it? They lack a prophet. Moses died, but Deuteronomy 18, there'll be one like Moses who'll come after him. And so this idea of Messiah, of the anointed one of God, who would stand in these three roles, and also the, the imagery of the one who, would, who could actually stand before God boldly, the Son of Man from Daniel, who can go before the Ancient of Days and not die, who is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. All of these ideas are, are, are promised in seed form, but there will be a substance that will come. And that substance, anthropos. There's a man who's coming. If you wonder why like, this is important, think about our word anthropology. Anthropology is a study of mankind as a category. Anthropology does not study every person individually and particularly. It studies mankind as, as we come throughout history. And usually it leads to some crazy things. But the idea of study of man should bring us to this. That mankind as a category, as a problem, and so one man, every other one is in the plural, this one's in the singular. There is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man, singular, Jesus Christ. Could there be one who would fulfill all these roles? The king who fell short, the prophet who fell short, the priest who fell short, the one who could actually stand in the presence of the true and living God, the ancient of days. There only has ever been and only will ever be one. The reality is monotheistic. There is one God. And I made up a word for this, I think. At least Google doesn't recognize it. And it is monosalvific. There is one God and one salvation. There is one God and there is one salvation. This is what Paul is getting at. This is the the, the case that he's being willing to make. How is it that we can be united in the church? How is it that we can be united in our gospel proclamation? Because there is one God, there is one big problem that we all share, and there's one answer. The only hope for all men, any stripe, any color, any creed, any nation, is the one man, 
Jesus Christ. We never graduate beyond this. This never stops being amazing. This never stops being our hope. This never stops being what we proclaim. This never stops being true. And the church in Ephesus, like the church in the 21st century, needs to be reminded of this week after week, and month after month, and year after year. And so this is the purpose of the entire book of Hebrews. And I really wanted to, I, I want to teach all of Hebrews this morning. We're not going to, but I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews. We're going to spend a little bit of time there. Because that's the entire purpose of the book of Hebrews. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than Joshua. He's better than the priests. He's better than the sacrifices. He's better than the temple. He's better than the high priests. And the references will be on the screen. So you can follow along with me. And this is, I'm just scratching the surface. There's plenty more we could do here, but I want you to get this. There's a reason why. When you read through the confession that we hold to, the chapter on Christ is Christ the mediator. Because that changes everything. We'll break that down a little bit more after we work through Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. The high priests of old, they would pass through the Holy of Holies. He has passed through God's very throne room, the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. What is our confidence? Jesus Christ is alive. And he has gone through the heavens. For we do not have a high priest. Here's where he's describing our mediator who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, fully human, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You could also say that the purpose of the book of Hebrews is to give the church confidence in Christ because of who he is and what he has done. Verse 1 of chapter 5. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He was chosen like every other high priest. Skip down to verse 4. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. In order to be the right mediator, the right high priest, he had to be man. He had to be appointed by and called by God. How do we know? You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Verse 6, and he says also another place, you are priests forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus began his intercession for us, offering up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Jesus is gentle and lowly, but he is not only gentle and lowly. We'll get there later. But he is passionate for his people. He cries out in the Father's behalf to sanctify us in truth. The ones you have given me, Father, I have kept them. I want them to be one as we are one. He prayed for Peter while he was being sifted by Satan. Why did Jesus pray? Because he knows that the Father he prayed to was able to save him from death and was heard because of his reference. Why do we have confidence in our prayers? Because our God saves. And how do we know our God saves? First and foremost, he resurrected Jesus from the dead. If Jesus was not resurrected, we of all people are to be pitied. If Jesus was resurrected, then we have all the confidence in the world because that's what our God does. And that's what our God does for sinners. Let's move forward to chapter 7. Verse 23. The former priests, here's what makes him different, were many in number. Verse 23 of chapter 7. They were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds a priesthood permanently because he continues forever. What makes our mediator better? His mediatorship never ends. His office never ends. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. How do we know that we are saved and we will remain saved? Because Jesus remains. Jesus is faithful. Never stops. Always makes intercession for his people. Let's jump ahead to chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, 
Then, through the greater and more perfect tent, that's the, the substance in heaven, not the shadow on earth, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he appeared to his incarnation from what is eternal to taking on what is, what is temporary. He entered once for all into the holy places from heaven to earth back to heaven, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood thus securing eternal redemption. His first work as mediator is on the cross. His first work of mediator is establishing peace with God by his own blood. That's our biggest problem. The first chasm, our sin. No prayer, nothing else is possible as long as that exists. Jesus dries up this ocean and breathes new life into us and binds us up and reconciles us to God through his blood. That is what type of mediator he is. And if you're not yet convinced, verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and or goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of the heifer sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will it purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He saved us from death to life that we may live for him. Therefore, verse 15, he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Here's the contrast. You are represented by one of two men, two men. The first man, Adam, all of us born into Adam are dead. Here's the problem. Your hope is one of two men. It is either the one man Adam who sinned and fell short or the one man Christ who didn't. The old covenant. Sinful men trying to reconcile themselves before a holy God with a sacrifice that won't last. The new covenant is a final sacrifice that lasts into eternity under the new Adam. New creation, a new covenant that cannot be broken. A covenant where hearts of stone are turned to hearts of flesh. A covenant where sins are forgiven. A covenant where sinners are declared righteous and preserved to the end. If you ask what distinguishes Reformed Baptists, this is what makes us Reformed Baptists. The new covenant is a covenant of salvation. The new covenant, all everything that applies to Christ in his covenant are on those who are in that covenant. You are either under Adam or under Christ. There's no middle ground. When you read the book of Hebrews and you say all the things that Christ has done as high priest, you in Christ, as him, as your mediator, you have all of the inheritances that are in Christ. Everything that he accomplished is now yours. That is the view of that the writer of Hebrew presents, Hebrews presents, and I want to uh, jump to the end of the chapter here. Verse 24, for Christ has entered, not into holy places, same kind of language, um, but each thing is building on one another. For Christ has entered, not into holy places, made with hands, which are copies of true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. This is what makes Seventh-day Adventism a cult. They believe that Jesus Christ has to, has to shed his blood forever and ever and ever and ever for your sins because it wasn't enough on the cross. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Praise God. And just as it was, it was appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having offered once, to bear the sins of many will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly await him. He came the first time to deal with the problem of sin. When he returns, those of us who are in Christ, those of us who have co he has covenanted with through his blood, we can eagerly anticipate his return because our salvation will be complete. And finally, in chapter 10, here's where it comes to prayer. Therefore, brothers, in verse 19 of chapter 10, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. What does that mean? One day we will stand in the holy presence of God, but here on earth we get to pray. 
We get to go before the throne of God, his very holy place, and we do it with confidence, not because of your faithfulness, not because you have the right words to say, but because of the blood of Jesus. His mediatorship on the cross continues in his mediation from the throne. His first mediation makes, gives us peace with God. His continued mediation gives us peace in our hearts through the Spirit and gives us confidence in our prayers. Verse 20, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. You must be reconciled on the cross first before you can go to the throne. That is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and from our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Don't let your prayers be hindered by your lack of faithfulness. The only thing that can hinder our prayers is either our lack of trust in him or a lack of Christ's faithfulness. He does not change, we do. Trust him. He is faithful. Go before his throne. And don't stop there. This is where individualistic Christianity stops. All of this leads up to verse 24, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Here's the problem in our culture today. And COVID has made, made this very easy. Because we have now made it acceptable to worship on home, and we have a, a, a live stream because we've got a pastor who's, home, uh, who's homesick. We've got a man in the hospital. We've got a couple other people with, with COVID. We've got people traveling. An online stream is never an excuse not to be in church. Why? Because God did not save you to stand, in, to, to be by yourself in this little island off on your own. What happens right after we realize that we have the blood of Christ that covers us and unites us? We go boldly before his throne. We stir one another up. You can't do that online. You can't do that home by yourself. You can't do that off on your own. This is why the body comes together, because Jesus Christ has covered us with his blood. And he unites us in himself. And everyone in this room who is in Christ Jesus, we get encouraged and built up by the saints. We stir one another on. As Jim said earlier, it's not a Sunday thing. It is an everyday thing. And if you are not doing that, you're missing. You are lacking. And if you wonder why it seems like I'm cranky or I'm critical or I'm not growing, are you stirring others to good works? Are they stirring you to good works? Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together. Think about it. We don't meet. Not we. You guys are great. We're full here. But we, in 21st century Christians, we don't meet because our view of Christ is so low. How many people will just throw the church away because they don't know what Christ has done for them? How many people will look so low on the gathering of the saints because they don't know what it represents? And we're not teaching it. We're not reminding ourselves. Again, you guys are good. I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but we need to recognize this. If our theology is that robust, that as we mentioned this morning, every time we approach the Lord's table, we're reminded of our mediator. Every time we sing, we're reminded of our mediator. Every time we preach and encourage one another and pray one another and, and we ask for salvation of those we care for, we're reminded of our mediator. You can't do that online. You can sing online. You can listen to things online. You, you, you can take classes to your head explodes. But you can't stir one another up. That is what all this comes... We are saved by grace, through faith, not of our own. Not that we would boast, so that we would do the good works he prepared for us beforehand. And this is what the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, encouraging one another. All the more as a day draws near. This world is getting more and more wicked. Every day we wake up, it is a day closer to Christ returning. And it is a day that we need one another and we need the body. Amen? I am less than halfway through my sermon. i got to move. <laughs> we got time. Um, but I want you to see this. Everything we're seeing in the book of Hebrews. All the Levitical priests cannot do that. All the Roman Catholic priests cannot do that. Mary can't do that. There is no intercessor. There, there is one. The one man. His mediation on the cross as lamb. Silent. Led to the slaughter. 
the suffering servant, the selfless sacrifice, the lamb. But when we go before the throne, we go before the lion of Judah. When he returns, he returns as a lion. Why the symbolism of lion? Strength, confidence, conquering king. The lamb has done his job in mediation on the cross. But now when we get to go before our God in heaven, we go before the lion. And if you are afraid, praise God indeed. If you are afraid that your prayers won't be answered, look to the lion. And if you sit here Sunday after Sunday and you're like, yeah, I get that. Sure, pastor, we agree. There's one. And I'm glad you do. But why must we be absolutely clear? Many of you uh, read Ligonier's survey, The State of Theology, where professing evangelicals were asked all types of questions. One of those questions was, does God accept the worship of all faiths, including, including Judaism and Islam? 22% somewhat agree. 45% strongly agree. 67% of professing evangelicals, people who believe in the resurrection, people who believe in the authority of Scripture, people who say that they put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ, 60% of them think they believe in pluralism, believe the opposite of what Paul is saying here. Why does this matter? Because if you've talked to many nominal Christians, you've had this conversation. I've had this conversation many times. The hardest people to witness to are the people who think that they're Christians. We are not talking about the same thing if God accepts all faiths, if God accepts all prayers, if God accepts all people indiscriminately, then what did Christ do? This matters for our theology and it matters in our prayers. There is no worship that is acceptable to God apart from the mediator. There is no prayer that is acceptable to God through the mediator. Now, without the mediator, excuse me, here's our pattern for prayer. Why do we pray the way we pray? How is prayer even possible? Here's the formula. Jesus taught us how to pray. We pray to the Father. His whole purpose in coming to earth and going back to glory is to glorify the Father. So we go before the Father. But the only way we have access to the throne is through our mediator, the Son. And the only way we know what to say and, and, and can say it is because we are guided by the Spirit. Prayer requires that mediation first on the cross. And the continued mediation is through a high priest who ever lives to intercede. And let me tell you this. This may be hard for many of you to hear. Prayer is impossible without Christ. It is. The unrepentant, the rebellious, the wicked, they have no access before the throne of grace because there is no grace. This is big, and we must understand that without Christ, prayer is not possible. It is empty words. We saw there's two of these in Proverbs. Proverbs 15, uh, 8. It'll be up on the screen quickly. Proverbs 15, 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayers of the upright is acceptable to him. Proverbs 29, 28, 9. Proverbs 28, 9. That'll be the next one. If one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Peter even says to believing husbands, if you're a jerk, it's going to hinder your prayers. In our day, many people pray. Something horrible happens. Or something horrible happens. They'll get on the news and say, thoughts and prayers are with you. By what standard? Who are you praying to? How do you have any expectation for prayer? What's your basis? When someone says that, oh, I'll be praying for you, your thoughts and prayers are with you. Really, tell me about that. What's your basis for prayer? How can you call someone if you don't have the number? How are you going to have a conversation if the person won't pick up on the other end of the line? Jesus is your dial tone. If you, those of you under 30 don't know what a dial tone is, <laughs> he's your cell reception. Like, you can't make a call without him. There is no communication with the Father without Christ. Now you're good? Okay, all right, all right. Forget how young most of you are. Who? Verse 6. Last thing I want to say there. Prayer is a privilege, not a right. 
Prayer is a privilege for the sons of God. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, it is not a right. All right, now we're finally into our second verse of three. 40 minutes in. Who gave himself as a ransom for all? Gave himself. Why does the Father listen to us? What is the basis? What makes Jesus, our mediator, close the gap between us and the Father? Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Look at how Jesus begins and ends giving of himself. For this reason, the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life. This is voluntary. No one asked him to do it. No one forced him to do it. That I may take it up again. It was never in doubt. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. He begins and ends with the Father. It is the love of the Father that sent the Son. It is the love of the Son that lays down His life for the sheep. And when we go before our God, it is the love of Christ that He sees. So this logic continues. That this kind of Paul is flowing out here. This man, the one mediator, He made it possible through his ransom. Why? Why do we need a ransom? Remember, there's a problem. Slaves aren't free. We're slaves to sin. We don't understand slavery the way our brothers and sisters in in Pakistan do. If someone owns you and you can't leave without being beaten or killed, you understand what it means to be enslaved. There is a ransom that is needed because they are held captive. Parents, if your child was held captive by a murderous kidnapper, how much would you pay for them to be released? What would the price of the ransom be? We are held hostage by our sin and our death. We will not be free. We cannot be free until the ransom is paid. Slaves do not have freedom to make prayerful intercessions. Sons do. You cannot call on Father if you are not a son. And you are not a son unless Christ has made you a son, unless He gives you His sonship through His righteousness. The Greek word here for ransom, it implies an exchange, one for the other. What is the exchange? It is Christ for the church. Look at Ephesians 5. This is another reason why this is not every person without exception. Who did Christ give himself for? Ephesians, the the beautiful picture of marriage comes out of the gospel. Husbands, love your wives as just like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Here's the exchange. Why did he do that? He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word so that he might present the church to himself without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. This God became man and took on flesh. This man became a ransom so that he could mediate for his church that they might be spotless and blameless. This is our gospel, this is our gospel formula. Deity, incarnation, crucifixion, exaltation. Who encompasses all these but one? The one for all. Now let's define our alls again. If you were here last week, we had a lot of fun with that, but we still must do it. Verse 6, again, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Okay, we got to define our alls again. Remember, so many may hear, all right, look, he gave himself as a ransom for all. Universal atonement, right? All without distinction. All without exception. Or did he? Did Jesus Christ ransom each and every person did he is each and every person the church are all of humanity without exception ransomed him or of our are all his sheep from every kind of person ransomed him i'm going to do this rapid fire these will be on the screen but i want you to see these there's a there's a distinction paul here is speaking missionally 
Paul is thinking the mission from your perspective goes out everywhere. But from God's perspective, theologically, there's a distinction. Starting in Isaiah 53, verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. Here's this substitutionary atonement for the many. He shall bear their iniquities. He takes on their sin. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. Again, there's lots. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and numbered, was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that he bore the sin of everyone everywhere because they would be forgiven. We'll get to that more in a second. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. I'm going to try to go quickly here. Mark chapter 10, 45, but I want you to see this pattern. Jesus himself in two passages in Mark, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give, him, give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, what does that many apply to? He used the same phrase when he institutes the Lord's Supper, chapter 14, verse 24. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many those covered in his blood, those who are under the ransom, those who he satisfies from Isaiah 53. Um, Hebrews 2, we read earlier. If you want to look at more, Hebrews 2, 10 through 18. Hebrews chapter 9 again. But I want to land on Revelation 9. Excuse me, Revelation 5, verse 9. This is the beautiful, final, succinct way of how we understand the all and the many. This is the song that is sung to the Lamb at the throne of God. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God. He actually took them, actually ransomed them, actually gave them to God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. This is the all people. Christ died for all kinds of men, every kind, without distinction. So why do we care? All right, Pastor Tim, why are you making such a big deal about this? Because many people make a big deal about this. But I want you to have an answer. Because if his price, if his ransom paid for all men without exception, and we know that all men are not saved, then Christ failed. If he died for all people without exception, if he ransomed a people for God, and then God sends them to hell, God is punishing their sins twice, and Jesus failed. The sins of man are greater than the sacrifice of Christ. But his sacrifice actually accomplishes something. Every one of these verses. He doesn't just have this empty ransom, this empty atonement that he hopes will somehow lead to fruit as long as you have all of your right ducks in a row. It actually does something. And I love Titus 2 for that. It actually accomplishes something. Look at the alls in Titus 2. Titus chapter 2. Starting in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Notice every letter written to churches are written to saints, written to believers. Who are the all people? Paul narrows it in. He defines it here. Training us. Who are the us? To renounce ungodliness. How can you renounce ungodliness if you are not born again? How can you renounce worldly passions? If Christ has not made you a new creature, how can you live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age? That is why God appeared. Or the grace of God, Jesus Christ being the grace incarnate. How can you wait for a blessed hope if you have none? The appearing of the glory of a great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from the lawlessness and to purify for himself a people. This is a clear, a people, not all people, a people. He comes for all people, every tongue, tribe, nation, but he redeemed a people. A church that is for himself, his own possession who are zealous for good work so that we do what is prepared for us before the foundation of the world. You get where I'm going here? So let's just summarize, if you're like, why all of this going back and forth with, with the all and the many? I want you to get the difference. When Paul says all, he is thinking missionally. Don't make distinction. Don't separate Jews and Gentiles. Don't think that that nation like Jonah did is not worthy of the gospel. He's not making a theological distinction. That's made elsewhere. This is a missional distinction. Don't 
become partial and don't limit the gospel. When we say all, we can mean it. There is a, a free offer of salvation to all people. As far as the accomplishment of it, that's up to God and there will be many. And our prayer is that the all become the many. And we can do that faithfully. This is the testimony. End of verse 6, given at the proper time. This is our message. The man, the Messiah, the mediator. Just like God determines the summer, winter, spring, fall, the seasons, he determined the proper time when he would send his son. And this is all perfectly according to plan. This is not plan B. This is plan A. Everything is as God designed it. And that is our confidence. The providential timing of the Father to reveal the Son. And this, final verse, for this I was appointed a preacher, an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is Paul's purpose in preaching. Proclaiming the testimony of Christ, ransom, and mediation. I was appointed for this, nothing else. This is the most important thing. This is what I was given. This is why Christ redeemed me so that I could give you this message. I want to talk about these two terms here quickly. Preacher. What is a preacher? Coming from the ancient word herald. Who is a herald? He's a big mouth. I'm in the right role. Um, he's a big mouth. The loudest voice who would declare the, the uh, winner's of the battles, those who rose to the top of the, the competitions and the conquests. Without amplification, without cell phone notifications, he walks through the middle of town. Hear ye, hear ye. My victorious king has slayed his thousands and he's on his way. The champion of champions has won the battle and he's coming. This is the job of preacher. It must be shouted from the rooftop because everyone needs to hear. Everyone needs to know that the king is victorious. That is preaching. Too many whisper. Hey, I kind of want to talk to you about this Jesus guy. And um, I know it might make you uncomfortable. And we'll try to make it as soft as possible. And then it might just kind of suggest it. It is to be proclaimed. Paul came to proclaim. And he did it city to city, synagogue to synagogue. He also came to teach. Let's be honest. Not every teacher should be a preacher. There is proclamation with power and with conviction, and there is explanation with precision. Not everyone can do both. A minister of the gospel must be able to proclaim and to explain. And this is what Paul says, I came to proclaim this. I am preaching it. Yet, I'm also going to explain it. I'm going to break it down for you, which is what he's doing here. He's an apostle. Just like Christ didn't appoint himself to his priestly duty, Paul wasn't appointed to his apostleship. And he reminds them because the, the scoffers there want to undermine his authority and push up their own. He is an apostle to the Gentiles. Preacher, apostle, teacher to the Gentiles. This helps us understand our alls. This is how Paul sees himself. There were 12 apostles to, to revive the 12 tribes of Israel in a spiritual house of God. And there was one for the Gentiles. This is his calling. This is Paul's desire for all nations. We can't continue Paul's apostleship, but we do continue his preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. This is why we pray for and we preach to, and we desire all peoples to be saved, because God is not just the God of Israel. He is a God of the Gentiles too. And praise him for that, because we Gentiles are the beneficiaries of that. And we can confidently say our God saves and he desires all people to be saved. Put your trust in him. That's a true statement. We can say that. Don't get too built up in your Calvinism that you can't say God desires all people to be saved. He does. And we're going to see all peoples, every tongue, tribe, and nation for all of eternity. Put your faith in him. And so every time we gather, we, re we are reminded of our mediator. But also every time we gather, every, time we, every opportunity we get, that all means all. If you are here this morning, without distinction, Jesus saves. He came for sinners. If you are trusting in yourself, 
If you are trying to stand before God in your own righteousness and say, yeah, God, I can jump from the chasm of my wickedness to your holiness on my own, you're a fool. You need a mediator. There is only one mediator, Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in him. In him there is life. In him there is peace. In him there is joy. In him there is access to the Father who loves you. And that is a free gift. There is nothing you can do. There is nothing you bring to the table. All you must do is die and leave your sin behind and trust him. So Paul's ministry, it's passed on to Timothy and so on and so on and so on and so on is for us in faith and truth. As we said last week, faith is the subjective thing that is not given to all, but is distinct to each one of us. We each must have saving faith in Jesus Christ. And that is because of the objective truth. The truth does not change. There is one truth, one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Our faith is in the truth. As I looked at George Mueller and uh, Hudson Taylor last week, I want to close with a with a great view of why we have confidence in prayer, how great our mediator is. I love this quote. Uh, I can't say anything better than this. I'm going to close with this. He says, On the ground of our own goodness, we cannot expect to have our prayers answered. But Jesus is worthy. And for his sake, we, have, uh, we may have our prayers answered. There is nothing too choice, too costly, or too great for God to give him. He is worthy. He is the spotless holy child who under all circumstances acted according to the mind of God. And if we trust him, if we hide in him, if we put him forward and ourselves in the background, depend on him and plead his name, we may expect to have our prayers answered. Take comfort in that. Praise him for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you only because you first loved us. Lord, I hope every person here this morning is encouraged to know Jesus Christ, the mediator. And if if they don't, I hope they are miserable. I hope they are so uncomfortable in their seat I hope they can't sleep tonight. I hope they don't sleep for a month until they turn to you. But for your saints, Lord, help us to find encouragement in this. We so often forget about our mediator. We so often forget that we have the privilege of going before the throne of grace. That you have made access possible. We can ask for ourselves. We can ask for others. We can just cry on the pillow. Because you love us. Because you hear us through Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And because even we would mess that up, you left us your spirit. Teaches us who intercedes for us. Lord, I just pray that your spirit would convict us of sin this morning, anything that is unresolved, that you would remind us of the goodness of Christ Jesus and know that if we are in him, we will persevere to the end because no one can snatch us out of our hand. He is our lamb. He is our lion. He is our Savior. He is our King. He is unwavering. He is unchanging, and He is coming again. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.